now we should be doing that. So they're all the same length on now? Oh, and like on Okay, we're not. Like, no, it's her baby. She looks, it looks, no. she looks, she looks nice. My dad was there and she was like, oh, it says great. Page not bald. Yeah. Okay, that's weird. <laughs> I had to cut Jenna. But she had a mullet. Does Len have a mullet? She has a mullet. Yeah. 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 Yeah
She's like, it's just so weird. She said, but you know, it's like, it seems like I had to write this down because what she said was so profound. Jenna said, if you, it seems like if you don't want to do something, you have to go through it first. And she had examples of that. She said, if you don't want to do your homework, you just have to do your homework and then you don't have to do your homework anymore. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to clean your room, you just have to go through it and clean your room and then you don't have to clean your room anymore. If we are to be overcomers, like Jesus overcame death, we actually have to go through the things. And it can be hard, but there is such promise on the other side of it. All through these letters to the churches, Jesus says, the one who overcomes will receive many promises. He will be given the right to eat from the tree of life. You will not face any pain in the second death. There, over and over it says this. So I just wanted to close this call to worship with John 16, 33. I hope it's encouraging to you. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world.
Morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. So today we're going to be going over the next two letters to the churches in Revelation. And before we jump right into it, a couple of things I wanted to hit on. And you guys will remember some of this from the previous weeks, but there's a lot of symbolism that goes on in Revelation. There's a lot of symbols that you might not have heard of. We're going to try to hit on those and make them clear what they are, but we're not going to do the full like historical background of each and every one of them because that alone could be like three or four sermons. Yeah, so so if, we just don't have the time. So we're going to give a definition for them as we go through them, but just be aware if you want to talk more about those, you can talk to us, you can talk to Dave or Caleb, LaShawn, Becky, anybody that you might want to talk to about it, and we can go more into that. But first, going to be hitting on Pergamum. So this is in Revelation 2. It starts in verse 12. Now, a little background on Pergamum. It's about 40 miles north of Sardis, which is one of the ones we've already gone over. And it was the center of Roman political power in the Asian region. And in reality, these guys actually worshipped power in this city. It, there was this obsession with it where religion and power and politics were all kind of synonymous. It was all about your status, about who you knew, and how much control you had. And so in that... There's a few kind of crazy facts about this city. It's the first temple of the Caesar cult where they built the temple to worship the emperor of Rome, um, Augustus Caesar. This is the location of the first temple. It's actually called the birthplace of the Caesar cult. It is also the location of a temple to Zeus, who is the Roman god of power. And there was an altar in that temple that's now in the Berlin Museum that believe it or not, Adolf Hitler himself would actually go and visit with his own obsession with power. And he would actually go to that same altar that was in this city. So you get that whole picture of like how power obsessive this city actually was. It was everything to them. So no distinction between politics and religion there. And so in the midst of this city full of pagan worship and power, we're going to see what God had to say to them. So starting in verse 12. To the angel of the church of Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has a sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. So, what's going on here? You have this city. They worship power. They worship status. It's everything to them. There's pagan worship that goes on. And there was a persecution that broke out against the Christians, where one of the faithful witnesses was killed. But these Christians did not renounce their faith. But instead, what they actually did is almost just as bad because they compromised on that faith to avoid that persecution. They engaged in these teachings that were unbiblical, enticing them to sin, where they could just sin and sin and just keep letting grace abound. There was the Nicolaitans, which is one of the other churches we've already gone to. That was one of the teachings they accepted that was false. And what these Christians were doing in order to have better standing in the culture around them, they were compromising on what the word would call them to be and what the word would call them to do. For their status and their political gain, for their own power, to be comfortable and to avoid this persecution, they were compromising on their beliefs. And so this is what God had against them and what he called them to repent from. God actually comes in and says that he is the one with the double-edged sword. That's a Roman symbol at the time for whoever had the double-edged sword is the one who had power over life and death. And so God is coming forward and saying, I am the one who is powerful. I am the one who is sovereign. It is my kingdom you are concerned with, not any kingdom or power of this earth. And so he comes right out the gate and asserts that you've been worried about your status here. You've been worried about this power and being in control. I'm the one who's powerful and I am the one who's in control. So right off the bat, he has to correct them in that. 
The 21st century biblical commentary puts it this way. I read this this week and it really spoke to me and I hope you guys will see what he's getting at. Religion has always had a precarious relationship to political power. When power is on the side of religion, it tends to corrupt it. But when power is against religion, it tends to persecute it. Unfortunately, the pressure of persecution often drives religion to seek power as a means of protection and self-preservation. In time, religion itself often falls victim to the very thing it opposes. And it's best summarized here. It has been observed more than once that the ultimate subversion of Christianity occurs whenever we confuse spiritual authority with political power. The reality is, is that we put ourselves in a dangerous place when we start ignoring what God's word says and what it calls us to be and how it calls us to live. And we live in a world where that's really easy. It is really easy to justify sin to ourselves because of grace. It is really easy to justify hatred and anger towards each other because we believe truth. It's really easy to justify wanting control over our own lives because it makes us more comfortable. But see, this is exactly why God had to call this church to repent. Is because that's exactly what they were doing. Compromising and compromising, and we needed to repent. And that symbol of that hidden manna at the end there, and the white stone, that's a symbol of the Old Testament priesthood, where Jesus is essentially asserting, I am the high priest by which you will receive your forgiveness. So come back and repent, because you've been compromising on your faith for your own gain, but you need to be focused on my kingdom and repenting to me, not this world. And then that takes us into Thyatira. So yeah, so Thyatira, that's the next uh, letter uh, that's coming after it. And there's a few interesting things. Connor kind of touched on part of it. You know, these letters were specific letters written to specific cities or towns at a specific point in time. But that doesn't mean we can't learn some of these lessons that Connor's talking about with these. Um, so a few things to get you to understand uh, the city of Thyatira a little bit better is, one, this is the longest letter out of all the letters in Revelation, and it's the smallest and least significant town out of all the towns that we're going to be talking about. Um, so it's kind of interesting that the smallest, least significant got the longest letter to them. Um, but what Thyatira was known for um, was it was centralized. There was a couple valleys that kind of fed into that town. So it was a great hub for trade. So what it was known for was being like housing a lot of trade guilds, a lot of trade routes, a lot of trade would happen there, but not a lot of people necessarily like stayed centralized there. Um, and a lot of the trade, there's plenty of things, wool, pottery, you know, there's just a big hub for all these things. But in society at this period in time, trading happened through guilds, like trade guilds. So you needed to be a part of a guild to trade whatever that guild represented. And then if you weren't a part of a different guild, it was very hard to trade with another guild. Like if you didn't have a guild you represented, Typically, they wouldn't let you trade with them because you weren't a part of one of these other guilds. You weren't like well known or like connected. And so it was kind of more of a risk to trade with you. So what the Christians were struggling with was they were trying to make it economically, care for their family, care for themselves, you know, their land, whatever they needed, resources to survive. But if they weren't a part of a guild, they couldn't trade very easily. But if they were a part of a guild, it meant that they had to compromise some of their Christian beliefs with that. So we're going to come back to that in just a minute. Um, and like I said, not a lot's known about this town outside of kind of what I just um, explained to you. Um, so um, this is structured much like the other letters, and we're about to dive in. Um, and this, since it's a little bit longer letter, I'm going to kind of read a section, explain what's happening, move to the next section. Uh, but much like the other letters, this starts with like the, hey, you're doing this well, like good job. And then it moves into the, now you suck at this, do better at this. And then kind of the pat on the back to like encourage them. It'd be much like, you know, correcting a child or like, you know, some of my coworkers at work. It's you start with the positive, show them what they need to fix and then kind of move back into the positive. And that's kind of how these letters are structured. So you're going to see that very clearly in this letter as we move forward as well. So we pick up with the letter to uh, Thyatira in uh, verse 18 in chapter two. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these are the words of the son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds and your love and faith, your service and perseverance that you are now doing more than you did at first. So to start out with this letter, it's addressing the town that it's going to. It's making the emphasis that it's referencing the son of God saying like, this is, you know, the emphasis of his majesty. This is who we're talking about. This is the standard we're setting for you. 
Then it talks about how his eyes are focused on you and then his feet indicating, you know, the swiftness of God's mercy and judgment can come through there. So it's kind of starting the letter by saying who God is, what he's capable of, and kind of the power behind them. And then here comes that first encouragement I was talking about. It says, you were doing more than you did at first. So meaning when like the church was planted in this town, they were doing, you know, something. Now the, ch the church, the town is doing more than they've ever done there. So they're doing better than they've ever done is what he's saying. So he's saying, you're doing more than you did at first. So you're, here's the pat on the back. You are doing more. You're trying to connect more to the town. Um, and just like Ephesus, though, it starts to talk about it in this next section where in Ephesus, the one of the other churches we learned about, um, they were sliding backwards. This church is doing the opposite. So Ephesus started and then they were kind of fading away from what they were doing. This church is doing the opposite. They started here and they're moving towards more Christ-like in some areas at least. So he's acknowledging what they're doing well. So it starts with that positive encouragement. Then moving into verse 20, nevertheless, so here it comes, here comes that, you know, what you need to correct. I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food and sacrificed idols. So right here, what they're talking about when I was kind of looking into this and diving in is the woman it's referencing Jezebel is not is most likely not the name of the actual person they're referencing in this town that is misleading people. Jezebel is a reference to um, the Jezebel from First Kings, who was the wife of Ahab, and she was you know worshipped um, Baal and kind of got Christians in that time period to kind of sacrifice a little bit of their faith to follow different gods or idols and worship different things. So he's making a reference in this letter saying that this person in question is acting like this Jezebel that you should know about from, you know, olden times. And so it's, it's not a direct, like that might not be the person's name, but based on what they're saying, that if she's leading people and people are following her, it would say that she has some sort of clout inside that town or popularity or following or things like that. So that kind of sets the stage of who this character kind of is, is it gives you kind of the background that she's not necessarily has the best motives at heart or leading people the best way possible. Um, and then picking up in verse 21, I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So once again, it's referencing the point that God is forgiving. He gives you time to repent. He asks for you to repent. He, he gives you this forgiveness, but he's now saying with this Jezebel in question that that's kind of out of the question now. They're kind of beyond that point with her, like he's given her those chances. And then verse 22, so I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. So now it's saying like, I gave her a chance to repent. She's not. So now she's going to be getting that judgment that we talked about in that first verse of this letter of that um, judgment of, of the swiftness and the, of God's majesty in there. So that's what's happening to her. But then it also gives that warning of if you're following her, if you're doing these actions with her, now is this my call to you to repent? Moving into verse 23, I will strike her children dead. Then all of the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. So once again, this is talking about God's majesty. Nothing is out of the ordinary to God. Nothing is unknown to God. He sees our minds. He sees our hearts. He sees our actions. And it, the children, when it's referring, the, referencing her children, is actually her followers. It's not talking about like her actually like birth child. It's talking about the people that are following her and following the ways she's talking about. Um, so just for some context in that point, because I know there's a lot that I kind of covered very quickly, is that it's talking about Jezebel, this, this individual in the town, leading people away from what the church should be doing. So they are doing a lot right, but they're doing some things wrong. And the historical context of that would be back to what I was talking about with the guilds. A lot of times in order to be a part of a guild in this time period, you had to partake in their banquets. Well, what they would do in the banquets was they would sacrifice meats to God, but then they'd turn around and eat them right afterwards. So they would like do a burnt offering, but then they'd eat them. And obviously if you're sacrificing something, but then turning around and using it for yourself, it's not really a sacrifice. So it started to blur that line a little bit for the Christians. And this Jezebel is saying, that's okay. As a Christian, that's okay. Because you have to be a part of the guild. So it's okay to do that. 
But then the banquets would typically lead into other things such as sexual immorality and things like that. So it was kind of that slippery slope of this one thing's okay and then it kind of slid into these others and she would continue to be like, that's okay because you have to be a part of society. So that's basically what's happening with these people that are following her and that's what this letter is calling out at this point is that fact of you're compromising and it's leading you down this slippery slope. So then in 24, now we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit back to like an encouragement pat on the back. Now I will say to the rest of you in Thyatira, you are you who do not hold her to her teachings and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burdens on you. So what it's talking about here is it's not saying you won't have burdens if you aren't following Jezebel and you're following Christ. It's just saying being a Christ follower is already a big enough burden that there's not going to be these additional burdens thrown on you because you're doing what you should. Now, what that means, there's some leeway that it doesn't necessarily say, are these people that they're addressing people not in guilds, just not partaking in this stuff, or people that are not in guilds, period, and they're trying to work and earn their keep without being a part of these entities um, specifically. But that's what it's talking about there. And then it moves into verse 25. Only hold on to what you have until I come. Quick little reference of saying, hold on to your faith till Jesus returns. He's not saying, hold on to like your money or your possession or anything like he's saying, hold on to what you have, meaning keep the faith, stand strong, stand firm, keep that until I return. Verse 26, to him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. So in this, it's talking about um, leading with an iron scepter is, is a reference to shepherding. If you're shepherding with an iron scepter, iron is strong, it's firm, but shepherds are also caring. Whereas pottery shatters easy. So making the reference to pottery is if you're following Christ, you're going to be strong like iron being guided by him. If you're pottery, you're basically going to be easily broken. And that's what that division is. Those of you who are following me, hold your ground, hold strong. Those of you who aren't, you're like a clay pot that it's going to get dropped off of a table. And then to wrap it up, verse 28, I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear to hear, let them hear what the spirit says to the churches. So real quick reference. This is something that I could do a whole sermon on what Connor was talking about. The morning star is basically referencing the Holy Spirit. It's saying that those followers who have the morning star have Christ's presence in them. So the morning star is a reference to basically Christ being with you. Um, and we can do a whole breakdown of that, but um, we don't have time to get into all that. And then it's interesting because in verse 29, it closes the same way as all the other letters close, saying those who have an ear to hear, you know, hear this. And the way I viewed this closing was it's almost like a rally call. It's saying, if you're hearing this, you might not be going through the same struggle that Tara is. You might not be going through the same struggles of these other towns, but it's saying, hear this warning. Here's something that a Christian is struggling with. And it might not be directly related to you, but at least hear this warning so that you know the things that you should avoid, the things that you should work against if they present yourself in life. It's a good example of things that we should watch out for, but not necessarily things that we are directly struggling with. Because once again, this letter was written specifically to this town. Uh, so the kind of thing I want to leave you with about this that I took out of this letter is that it's easy to say, well, I'm a Christian and I'm going to go against society and you know, I'm going to stand up against all these things and ha, huh, because I'm a Christian. That's not necessarily what this is saying. And there's a phrase that I heard a long time ago. It's saying being in the world, but not of the world. As Christ followers, we're called to be in the world. We live in the world. We brush shoulders with non-Christians and other Christians alike daily. And that's what we're called to do. We're not called to hide our faith away and keep God to ourselves. But at the same time, being of the world means you're partaking in these things. And that's what Thyatira was struggling with, was they were saying they were following Christ, but they were falling into that trap of the things of the world. And it's a very fine line, and it's hard to navigate that as Christians. So it's, it's that balance of, I'm not shoving my faith into people's face. I'm not hiding it away. I'm not living completely what society tells me to do, but enough to be a Christian in society. It's a very fine line we walk. And that's what this is, letter was addressing with them, is to live in the world, but not of the world. What's interesting about both these churches, Pergamum and Thyatira, is that although the specific things that they struggled with were different, they both had this complex with truth and obedience, where Pergamum remained faithful when persecution happened, but then compromised on what they were allowed to do or allowed to believe so that they wouldn't be persecuted anymore.
and Thyatira, they were doing a lot. Like Mike said, they were following God in a lot of ways, but then at the same time, they were justifying sinfulness so that they would fit in better with society. And so if you and I are going to hear this and see what is happening with these churches, it becomes necessary that we remind ourselves who God is. Because it's the same thing that we do every day, and it happens around us all the time. Whether we do it for our own comfort, to stay in control of our lives, and to, and to just be comfortable, or we do it to justify our own sin because, well, we have grace, so I can sin all I want. Whatever it is, you and I do the same thing. And we don't even realize it when it's happening. Because, again, in our minds, we're Christians, and so how could we be wrong about this? But it's necessary to remind ourselves that God alone is the final word on all of this. He's the one with the double-edged sword, the power over life and death. He's the one that guides us with the iron scepter. He alone is the one in control. It's his kingdom that we follow. So, yes, we're in this world, and we interact with this world and the people around us, but God alone is our kingdom, and he alone is home to us. And when we repent, God alone is our high priest. Like he mentions with the hidden manna and the white stone, we go to him for that forgiveness. Because apart from him, we can't figure this out on our own. See, we try to do that. We put on that label of Christian. And we think, okay, I'm going to figure out what this looks like to live. And we, we just get it wrong. But what I hope you hear more than anything from these letters is not that God is here just beating you down with a club for being wrong about everything or patting some people on the back, but that the broken heart of the Father just wants us home. More than anything, God is speaking personally to these churches with an encouragement that applies to us because he so badly just wants us home. He is Lord over all and sovereign. He is the high priest for forgiveness. And he is the lamb that was slain for you and I so that we could come back to him. And that keeps coming up in Revelation over and over again, as you'll see. So these letters are not just putting you down, but they're calling you back. God wants more than anything for us to see this in ourselves and come back to him. There's actually someone in my life that for years and years, we had kind of a rocky relationship. We didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. We had a lot of arguments. And what finally helped us kind of get our relationship back together and, and be good again wasn't an argument that one of us ended up winning. It wasn't trying to be right about something. But it was when we both realized that more than anything, we loved each other and just wanted to be with each other again. This was a friend of mine that we had just gotten so far apart. And when we realized more than anything, we just wanted that friendship back. That, w that is what was able to bring us back together to be friends again. And so what I hope you hear from these letters is that God more than anything wants you back. He's not trying to put you down, but to call you back into life, to call you back into his kingdom. He points these things out to you so that you'll know that he is truth and that he is grace and that he is home for you. That's what I get from these letters, and I hope that's what you guys are getting as well. All right, let's pray. Lord, just um, thank you for, even though we weren't together, but a weird way of being it together as the church family today. I thank you for this uh, passage in Revelation, this letter to these these towns and these churches. And I just pray that as we continue to navigate uh, Revelation, that it would be stuff that that is understood by everybody out here. I pray that your will would just carry through with them. I pray that your word would just empower them to understand what these letters are, are telling and that it will at least, at the very least, give everybody listening to this encouragement in their own life to turn to God, to turn to God more, to work more towards God instead of being pulled away by all these distractions that society offers. I pray that we, as we go about our day and our week, um, that that this these, these letters would just you know be in the back of everybody's mind. That they would think about their actions daily. Are they are they sliding slightly away from Christ and slightly into society, or are they standing strong? Are they living in the world or of the world, Lord? I pray this in Your name, Amen. As you guys were talking, I was thinking of, um, sorry, I didn't ask. I didn't ask if I could talk, people. Sorry. 
<laughs> oh, but I was thinking of parenting. Um, both of you kind of referenced that, and God is the ultimate parent. He's our Father who loves us. And one of the hardest things about parenting is disciplining <laughs> and being disciplined. <laughs> um, but as I'm going to call out Marcia Young. She spoke a handful of weeks ago, and she taught us this little phrase recently that reminded me of what you were saying, Mike, about in these passages, God's like, good stuff, you suck, good stuff. <laughs> and Marcia calls it kiss, kick, kiss. <laughs> so I'm going to leave you with that because good parenting and being a, a child of God takes hearing the kiss but also the kick, and then knowing that we're loved ultimately in the end. Let's sing our doxology together. Praise God from